everyone. I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to another session of my happiness hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire and create. We do this every Wednesday night live here on Zoom with a new topic and a new speaker. On Tuesdays, I post the list of upcoming presentations to my Instagram, which is at Cousin Linda and on my website at lindanickel.com. And that's where you're going to find all of our previous sessions that are linked to YouTube. Aaron Randall is finally back here in Austin, so you get to say hello, Aaron. Hello, Aaron. <laughs> Our guest this evening is John Weatherby, and he is joining us from Florida. John is a commercial photographer who counts Hilton, Pepsi, T-Mobile, and Home Depot as clients. And if you follow him on Instagram, you'll see that he's passionate about travel, and Iceland is probably one of his favorite places to visit. John is an accomplished landscape astrophotography and travel photographer, and his images pop off your screen as you scroll through his feed. He uses color and light to tell his stories. In tonight's session, John shares his passion for the Aurora Borealis. For Northern Lights, no matter what you call them, they are mesmerizing, and John will tell you everything you need to know to capture them. So John, welcome to the Happiness Hour community. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and I really appreciate that you took the time to come in and do a presentation for my group. So well done. Thank you, no worries at all. It's uh, my pleasure for sure. I'm honored. Okay, awesome. Mesmerize us. <laughs> well, I don't know how much mesmerizing I'll do, but you know, the, the Northern Lights, I think will do that at least they do that for me every time. So and I don't know if it'll be the same in photos as it is to actually seeing them. But, um, yeah, so the Northern Lights. So the Aurora Borealis, uh, a lot of people know just of the Northern Lights, but a fun fact is that there's actually Southern Lights as well. So the Aurora Australis are visible in the Southern Hemisphere, um, like in An Antarctica, for instance, but I actually found that out just like a year ago. So fun fact, but has anybody in the group actually ever seen the Aurora? Okay, so you guys I have, have, but this is because I live in the middle of nowhere. Um, yes. Oh, okay. We're seeing a few yeses and I'm gonna monitor this chat for you, John, but yeah, you're getting... Um, okay. I know Chris has seen the Aurora. Yeah, 100%. yeah. So, Chris, where did you see it? Somebody, Matt is saying Fairbanks, Fairbanks, Alaska. Valerie, I know Valerie's seen it in northern Michigan. And um, we've got Iceland in there. Um, Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, definitely interesting because you can see the northern lights in the States. I mean, it's really just basically off the latitude. So if it's a really strong northern light show, then you could potentially see it, you know, in northern U.S. Uh, states. So it's, it actually blows my mind when I see people post aurora shots from like Washington or Lake Michigan or something. It's really cool. Uh, it's usually not ever as strong or kind of like prominent as aurora from Iceland or somewhere else for, further north, but still very cool. I see a lot of people have been to Iceland. That's awesome. Yeah. There's somebody in here from Can has seen it in uh, Alberta. That's very cool. Okay. I haven't been to Canada, so I'm super jealous. <sighs> I can't believe I haven't been to Canada yet, and now <laughs> I can't go to Canada. So. <laughs> Canada, I've only seen a pinch of it, but it is beautiful. Nice, Chris. Yeah, I definitely want to go to Banff. Oh, Banff. Okay. All right. So yeah, the aurora. So what the aurora actually is, what we see is charged particles from the sun. So these charged particles get taken to our atmosphere from solar winds. So this is what's referred to as a solar storm. So the particles, you know, depending on the elements in the atmosphere that they interact with will make different colors. So they could be green or magenta, or I've even seen like more reddish hued aurora and also some blue tones as well. So it's pretty cool. So the strength of the aurora is based off, you know, the 
the strength of the solar storm. So this is how this is how scientists or uh, you know whoever can read these forecasts and make these predictions determine how strong the aurora forecast is. It's based off of the the solar storm activity. So typically, there's you know there's different websites that you can check them out. So 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 first off, I guess let me tell you guys the the kind of basics, I guess, to see the aurora, and then we can go more kind of in detail for each. So uh, obviously, or for the northern lights, you need to be kind of in a northern region, northern polar region like Iceland or Canada or Alaska uh, or Sweden, for example. And there's a few challenges that come associated with that. And that is that, you know, these really far north place, <clears throat> excuse me, these really far northern places have different periods of daylight. So this is something that you have to consider when you're trying to see the aurora is that there's an aurora season. And really the aurora is visible all year long. It's just that these places where you can see it at, um, you know, it's daylight 24 hours sometimes. So I'll probably heavily refer to Iceland uh, for this presentation just because Iceland's like my second home and it would be second nature for me. So Iceland, for example, you can see here for this sun graph that, you know, basically the dark areas here show the uh, night periods and then the middle are daylight. So you can see here beginning um, late April or like mid April, it starts to, you know, become basically uh, not pitch black dark at night and it starts to you know basically not get completely dark and then as you move here into the summer months you have periods where basically you know the sun just barely goes below, below the horizon comes back up so this is really cool in Iceland for example for the midnight sun where you can go and photograph you know six seven hours of you know golden hour because of this kind of like weird like sunrise or sunset blending into sunrise type deal, um, but not so good for the aurora. So you can't, you know, obviously go see the aurora in the summer. Uh, so then you can start to see them basically in like late August. So I've actually, I was in, I was in Iceland in August last year. And I think I left like August 20th. And I was so pissed because like the day after I left, there was the first aurora of the season. And uh, I mean, yeah, it wasn't that bad because it's, you know, very faint. So at that point, it wasn't even completely getting dark yet. So the aurora that was seen, you know, is barely visible. Uh, so the best times to view the aurora, in my experience, have been September in Iceland, for example, have been September through March. So like, mid-September, early September through late March is really good for the aurora. Even probably up until, you know, basically, basically the first couple of days of April. So, so John, yeah. what website are you using right here? Yeah, so this is just timeanddate.com slash sun. And I think I just, I literally just Googled sunrise, sun sign, sunrise and sunset times, Iceland. Okay. And this came up, but I've used this one a couple of times just to kind of plan ahead for for trips and kind of make sure I'm picking some good dates. And uh, you know, for instance, this is another thing to consider. This is a challenge. Um, if you go to Iceland in winter, for example, there's only like five hours of daylight. There some some days even less. So your travel time, you know, basically what you can see in Iceland during these short days is very limited outside of the aurora. So it's like, you know, it's a trade-off always when you're going to somewhere like Iceland, you're gonna kind of see if you can find some dates that work really good for kind of like a middle ground. So for example, and my favorite times for Iceland are like late September and late March because you're kind of in this like 12 hour of daylight, 12 hour of, um, darkness season. So then you can have, you know, a good balance between the aurora and also have a lot of daylight to explore and travel. So for instance, if you want to shoot somewhere at sunrise and you want to go somewhere completely different for sunset, 
you know, that's in another part of the country, it's almost impossible in the winter because you gotta, you know, you travel three hours and you're like, it's like already sunset. Yeah. So that's something to consider. Um, the other factor to consider is weather. So weather cooperation is necessary to see the aurora. So similar to any astro photography, you need clear skies. And Iceland, for example, is very, very notorious for crazy weather in the winter. So this is kind of why I like the fall and kind of uh, early spring for Aurora and for the, the daylight hours because the weather is a little bit more mild in my experience as well. So I have a story actually in Iceland in January last year, we got blown over in an RV. So we got caught in a storm. We were parked basically in a line of cars and a gust of wind literally knocked us and flipped our RV 360 degrees over back onto the wheels and totaled the RV. And this was just from a gust of wind. So not to scare you guys, but Iceland is equally beautiful as it is dangerous. And definitely you have to kind of uh, research the areas that you go to, figure out you know if there's any type of threats, for instance, the wind. Before that trip, I didn't realize that the wind was such a big deal in Iceland. I know that the winds got strong, but I didn't realize that there's a website that you can check the wind strengths that everybody checks in Iceland. Um, and I didn't also know that they have basically like traffic signs. Like we have, you know, like streets, like road signs on the highways and stuff. They actually have the wind uh, readings along the roads in Iceland. So. I found this out afterwards, you know, now I know I'd like to check this, you know, thing and check the site. But here I'll actually show you guys real quick on the screen. So jumping a little bit ahead here, but this is actually um, a site that I use to track Aurora and cloud coverage and weather. And what is that just because it's super tiny? Oh, let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. It could be my old lady eyes as well. There we go. A little bit better. A little bit. Yeah, it's a little bit better. Yeah, so this is Veter, Veter.is. And let's go to weather in Iceland. And this is English. Okay, so we got wind. No, there's a wind forecast. Matt's asking, is your Aurora more active at certain times of the year? You know, this is just theory, but I I want to say, I, I can't really call that. I can't really give you an accurate um, answer on that. But in my experience, I've been to Iceland uh, 12 times now, and I've seen the Aurora in many different months there. And in my experience, I've been there multiple times in September and March, like I mentioned. And around the new moon in September and around the new moon in March, the Aurora has been incredible. Every time I've gone, it's been like super strong, um, super strong forecast for the Aurora. So I'm looking for the wind here. So while I'm talking, while I'm looking for this wind, I'll just tell you guys. So basically there's a, a spot on this website where you can check the wind and it shows it in like a color code and basically whenever it's purple you just like don't get in your car or leave or go anywhere if you're in that zone with the purple um so this is something to consider the weather and any type of you know challenges specific to the area that you're planning to visit so um aside from the actual wind the clouds like i mentioned are super important for you to get clear skies so rarely does it ever work out that you have amazing clouds at sunset which you want and then it clears out in time you know for the aurora or astro photography at night uh, when it works out like that it's amazing but usually it's like clear at sunset and then it's cloudy at you know when the aurora comes out or the milky way rises but something that i've learned from experience is that it's really handy to travel in camper van so if you 
travel in a camper van, for instance, then you can, you know, basically chase the clear guys, the clear, clear patches. So I use a few different websites and apps for weather. Um, one that I really like is yr.no. It's a Norwegian site. <clears throat> and it's based off of the uh, universal, universal time plus two. So it's a little confusing because I think, I think uh, Iceland is either universal time or universal time plus one. Uh, but basically you'd have to just kind of account for that with the hours. But I like this this site a lot because let me actually just go from the actual site so I can show you guys how to find this. So if you were to actually go to the website, it would first prompt you to select your language. So let's go, should be in English, right? No? Let me refresh that. Yeah, I think it's in English. Okay, great. So then you would search for your location. So let's just type in Reykjavik, which is the capital of Iceland. And then you have this little map over here. So if you double click on the map, then it opens up this precipitation map, cloud and precipitation. So I really like this map a lot because I can, you know, zoom in and basically see quickly the weather in a lot of different places. So well, this thing just doesn't want to cooperate. <laughs> Maybe it's um, selling a hundred percent. Okay. This is fine. So yeah, I can just pan around in the map and I can see the weather is absolute crap in Iceland right now. At this time, it's like, it's raining and snowing basically everywhere. Um, overcast over here, so you can see. So let's just jump ahead so I can show you some different icons here. But I like this a lot because we would use this in conjunction with our Aurora forecast to figure out where we want to be when it's clear. So, you know, obviously, if the Aurora was going off right now at this exact time, then we can see that, you know, we're screwed basically um, as far as seeing it. But if you jump ahead or you jump, you know, ahead multiple days, you'll see the icons update and maybe the weather doesn't change no this is i don't think it's updating is it changing at all it doesn't appear to be but no it doesn't which is weird and these little boxes up here are flashing which leads me to believe that it's like trying to refresh weird I'm just gonna reload this. So, of course the site that, oh, here we go. So this is updated now. You can tell it has changed because you can see the sun. Hey, the John. Sun. Yes. Hey, we're getting a little bit of feedback. We think it's coming from your microphone. Do you think? Does it sound bad? It wasn't bad to me, but I've got a couple of people saying, do you hear this? <laughs> so. Hold up. You hear this? Yeah, there's, there's, it sounds like a radio or something that's. I don't think that the audio is coming from the microphone that I am okay. using this, this, uh, okay. This one. So let me see if I can change my settings real quick. Because yeah, that would be. I plugged this nicer microphone in to. Yeah, several people are saying, kind of saying there's Here we something go. All right, it should be on the other mic now. Yay! Okay, that sounds better to me. How about you guys? Maybe you should say a couple of words. So yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is much better. You guys can hear me? Yeah. Better? Okay, perfect. Better? Definitely louder. Sounds like there's a duck in the room. Okay, wow. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Hold on. I don't know what that means either, Ben, but... <laughs> On this, real quick. this should be a little bit better, I think. Is this better? Yes. Okay. I think so. All right. All right. All right. So back, back is now gone. Thank you. Yeah, of course. No problem. So now back to our example here. We can, you know, 
basically plug in times for sunset and sunrise. And this is off topic from the Aurora, but I can see quickly, you know, where it's going to be partly cloudy or where I want for a sunset. And then I can go into the night hours or when the Aurora is strong or predicted to be strong and then check for clear skies. So let's see. And we'll know if this is working because at midnight Friday, the sun should not be visible. <laughs> so I don't know if this is updating, but basically the idea of this map here, and I don't know why it's giving me trouble. Maybe it's because I'm on Zoom. Um, you know, basically this map will show you in real time the weather. All right, so that's that's one of the sites that I use. I'll, again, I mentioned that I use this Vitor.is. You guys getting feedback again? Yeah, a little bit. Uh-oh. All right. Uh, hopefully. Yeah, let's, maybe it's just me. No one else is complaining, so. <laughs> All right. So here's the Northern Lights forecast. Um, let me go to the clouds. So let's go to cloud cover forecast here. So this website is really handy for a quick visual of clear patches. So in Vitor, you have the option to do low clouds, central clouds. And I think this is high clouds. It just didn't translate for some reason. And then you have the composite, which will show you I feel like nothing in my internet is not working. It doesn't seem, okay, it, it's definitely working, okay. So the composite will show you a combination of the low and, and mid clouds. And basically we wanna find areas that are white, which sig signify that it's clear. So if the aurora is gonna be strong, for instance, on midnight, Friday, then we would wanna be in one of these areas where it's clear. So let's actually look at the aurora forecast so to check the aurora forecast i usually use this site here and this is called aurora aurora-service.eu there's also an application on your phone or uh, that you can download called um my aurora forecast it's really super creative creative name uh, i think i can share my actual screen with you guys hold on one sec yeah, it looks good. So I set, set it up to where I could show you guys my cell phone screen. All right, so this is the Aurora forecast on the phone. So this app is really handy. Um, right now it shows that the KP index is 1.67. So I was referring to earlier, I can hear like some feedback uh, I can't actually even see the chat right now. So Linda, just let me know if anybody. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm watching it. <clears throat> so the forecast is going to be in a uh, number rating by KP. So if you see here on this chart here, so we have KP zero through KP eight. And this signifies the strength of the Aurora storm or the forecast. And you can see that if you have KP two or three, that you can see it you know, basically down in Iceland. And if you had, you know, a KP8, you would see it in the US or, you know, even possibly down here in like Germany uh, or Ireland or, you know, the UK or something. So this is, this is very strong. So the forecast you would check and I should have showed it at the top here. So, there's supposed to be a three-day forecast right here, and it's not showing. So let's let's go over to this website here. So Vitor also has a Northern Lights forecast, which is very handy. Um, you can check this number over here. This signifies the KP. So we can see that Thursday night or whenever I'm, you know, I, wherever I move this, it'll show the the prediction the activity and you can kind of scrub through this and see if it changes to a three or a four or five for instance you would know it would be a good show 
Uh, two, you can definitely see the aurora, possibly. So, you know, I would still definitely try to be in a place with clear skies if it said it was going to be a two. Um, you know, it's, it's really, the forecast is similar to the weather, so it's never spot on, but you can still, um, hold on one second. I could, I kind of had a little box up before where I could see you guys. So you want to see us? Yeah, I could see like a little box. Are you with talking about the gallery? Maybe. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Cool. I, yeah, I guess I can't see the chat either way. Well, I can, I'm watching the chat. There's not anything in there. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the whole thought process here is to, you know, check the forecast and be somewhere where you can see them. So first off, you got to be in a, the actual location, like country. And then, you know, another factor, the next one we actually can discuss real quick is light pollution. So you can't really see the aurora very well in cities, like big cities, where you have a lot of street lights and stuff like that. So same thing with, you know, Milky Way photography. You got to be in low light pollution areas to be able to see the Milky Way or Northern Lights and Milky Way. So that's another thing to consider. And you want to make sure that you're taking that into account along with the weather for your location to shoot the Aurora at. So you have sites like Dark Sight Finder here. And I already have gone to the search bar and just plugged in Reykjavik to pull up Iceland. And then you can basically zoom in and you can see on these dark are these light pollution maps. And this is, this is the same for shooting Milky Way as well. You can see the areas that show in the, let me actually pull up the key here. So you can see dark to bright here. So the areas that are in bright red are the strongest light pollution. And then you can see the colors that correspond to the different uh, levels of light pollution. So ideally you would find an area that is gray or black, basically with no color to shoot the aurora, which amazingly is most of Iceland. I mean, what, you can even see the aurora in Reykjavik, even though, you know, if it's a really strong aurora, you'll still be able to see it in Reykjavik. I've seen it in the middle of the city, um, which is pretty incredible. But, you know, most of Iceland doesn't have light pollution. I mean, once you leave some of these small towns, five minutes driving, not even, you know, you don't have any type of light pollution. So that's one beautiful thing about Iceland and some of these smaller um, place, you know, smaller countries and places that, you know, it's actually possible to see the aurora at. So the last thing that we need to consider is the moon phase. So the moon goes through different phases every month. So we start with a new moon and then, you know, gradually changes to a full moon. So you can use sites uh, online to check the uh, moon forecast or the moon cycle, I mean, or you can use an app. So let me pull up the app that I use. And the app is called PhotoPills. And you, can you guys, you can see the screen, the yeah. phone? Okay, great. So just pull this up. I think most so, people are probably are familiar with photo pills that are in this room. So okay, we're good. Perfect. So actually, you know what? I'm really surprised. And if Rafael Pons, the founder of photo pills, is watching this or sees this, <laughs> you guys need you guys need to add Aurora function to this app. I don't. I just never realized this till now. But why is there not Aurora forecast built into this app? It would That's be a very good question. It would be super handy. You know, because right now I'm going to check the moon phase um, to check for the aurora. Why, why would you not have like a KP index or forecast? So maybe, I don't know, I haven't updated this app in probably over a year. So maybe it's there. All right. So we have the moon phase visible. If you go to your pills and then go to moon, you can scroll through and see basically when the moon phase is. And this is handy for Astro guys. If you don't use photo pills, you can see also the galactic center visibility when it starts and uh, when it ends. 
So ideally we shoot Astro during the new moon because the most stars will be present and the, the sky, sky will be darkest. So the, you know, even the most subtle Northern lights will be more visible. Uh, now the moon doesn't really make a huge difference if the aurora is really strong, but if it's like a half moon or more, then it's just gonna, it's gonna really fade the sky out. The sky is gonna look washed out. And basically you're, you know, you're not gonna wind up with um, very good aurora shots. So there's one advantage actually to the moon, and I should mention this, is that it can light up your foreground. So that's really handy if you're, you know, shooting in the middle of the dark because, or in the middle of the night because it's pitch black dark. So one of the challenges with night photography is that you can't expose for the ground and the sky at the same time. So the moon, you know, will help to um, light up your foreground for you. So you could potentially get an aurora shot with a lit foreground and kind of like one of these single shots. Otherwise, you have to blend multiple shots. And myself personally, I really like to take blue hour shots and then blend those with night images because it produces a super clean effect. And that's known as compositing. Um, you know, definitely a hot, hot topic. But I'm trying to find, actually I have a picture I wanna show you guys of a moonlit um, foreground in Iceland. So, yeah, the moon phase is something that you need to take into account. So ideally, if you're gonna plan a trip for the Northern Lights, then you want to plan it around the new moon potentially, um, you know, just basically get the best results. But again, I've also shot the Northern Lights and, you know, I've also done trips where just, you know, going like during not, the, not when it's the new moon is impossible. So it's just is what it is. So let me actually, I just pulled this photo up here. I'm about to put it on the screen. And the, sorry, the chat box or the Zoom box is like blocking the button I need to click on this website. Yeah, you can move that bar, I believe. Yeah, I think I, think I just. Well, I used to be able to move mine. Um, so Robert wants to know, when is the next solar peak? If it, it is on 11 year cycles, right? Do you know that answer? Yeah, I don't. Um, we could Google that real quick. I could probably tell you in one second. So yeah, uh, what Robert's referring to is that there's like solar, there's a solar peak. And it's solar activity peak, maybe. And basically, it's going to be like a like so solar cycle twenty four reaches maximum period April twenty fourteenth peak. Um, basically, when you have like a a peak year, then you're going to have crazy aurora storms and activity. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a very good answer for you for that. Sorry. Right. <laughs> uh, but that's the gist of it. Basically, there's there's certain years that, you know, there's going to be peak activity and then, you know, essentially you could get yeah. ridiculous aurora storms. Well, Chris is just saying, why don't you just come up with your own Weather Be Weather app so we would Yes. Yeah. But add it, add it to your bad list. Idea. I'm very busy. What was that? I said, just add it to your list. I know that you're not very busy. <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is the a moonlit aurora shot here. So you can see the aurora isn't very prominent. This is kind of a crappy edit. This is uh, eh, uh, there's something kind of weird with these clouds. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's just a screen. But the uh, the foreground is completely lit. So you know this looks like it's daytime almost because you know basically the moon is bright and it's almost a full moon. And it's just lighting up the whole foreground when I expose for this night shot. So the bar, the Aurora bar is very, you know, faint looking compared to, I'll show you something like this is when there's no moon out and the Aurora is just like going crazy. You can see, 
a big difference here. So let me actually show you guys some shots from January last year before we almost died. <laughs> yeah, show me some pictures. That's what I want to see, your pictures. Yeah, okay, so this and this aurora storm was insane. So this was a, this was our second night in Iceland on, in January last year. And it was a KP6. So the, the sky just exploded. So you can see that these, you know, the aurora can come in different shapes and colors. You can see some purple tones here. And, you know, basically you never, you're never gonna get like two same aurora shots. So it's always different and it's always something kind of unique and special. Yeah. which is really cool. So you can see here, I didn't change my settings between these shots, but the Aurora flare during this shot was so strong that it, the highlights got blown out. So something else you need to take account is that they vary in brightness even you know, during, um, during a show. So you gotta kind of change your settings on the fly. So the settings I'm gonna talk about in just a second, but the, let me show you some other shots from that same storm. So this is some other pictures. So this is just insanity. Um, as you can imagine, you know, you're out in the middle of Iceland and you look up and you see this in the sky and you just lose, you lose your stuff, right? Like it's, uh, it's, it's like a spiritual experience. That's the best way I could, I could describe it really. Um, first time I ever saw the Northern Lights, actually funny story. I went to Iceland my second time with a fashion photographer who was a good friend of mine. And she had some editorial shoots and she had like a bunch of shoots set up with models and model agencies. And I went with her and her wardrobe stylist and her hair and makeup artist. And our like third night in, we're at our Airbnb and the Aurora came out. And me and the um, wardrobe stylist went outside and we saw it. And I swear, like, I don't even, I barely even knew her. And like, we just started jumping up and down. And I, we were like, I was just like hugging her, just like so excited, <laughs> like screaming. You know what I mean? Like, it was so, it was, it was so funny. We just like shared a moment. So, yeah, uh, I'm getting kind of excited just like talking about the Aurora. So let me interrupt you because people are now getting excited and they want to know settings. Okay. And so there's another question that Chris had was, do you bump up your ISO to keep your shutter speed low? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's, let's actually check the settings on this. So this was 13 seconds. You guys can see my screen right here. I don't know, it's kind of probably small. It's, this yeah. was 13 seconds, ISO 4000. And this is on a lens that has manual aperture control and it didn't show it, but it was F2.8. So at 13 seconds, at 12 millimeters, this appears to be star streaks, but I, I'm certain that it's, see, so the stars in the middle here are sharp, yeah. and the ones out here look streaked. So it's not actually star streaks, it's just distortion from the lens. So let me go back to the other folder, and I'll show you some different um, shots of different settings, and you can see what star streak looks like. So here we have, here we have a 15 second shot. Can you open that big? Yeah. So here, let's show, I'll show you a 20 second shot. So this was 20 seconds at 3.2 and this is 12 millimeters. So I doubt this is, this is actually out of focus too. So shame on me for that, but. It just made uh, me feel better about my own shots. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place, guys. Um, let's, let's talk about settings real quick. Actually, before I dive into settings, I just wanna kind of finish a point that I was trying to make earlier and kind of just talk about the whole planning process, right? So really, you wanna check the forecast, figure out when it's gonna be good. So let me pull my screen back up here and we'll go back to Aurora. All right, so on this app here, it's called My Aurora Forecast. You can check the KP index. And then if you go over here to forecasts, it shows the, so this is, 
This is for Iceland right now. So it shows the KP forecast here for the next hour. So it says 1.67 now, and it's predicted to be 1.33 for the next 60 minutes. Then further down, it shows the upcoming days, and you can scrub through this. So it doesn't look like there's going to be any crazy strong aurora activity um, you know, in the next couple days. And then further down is a long-term forecast. So now I can scrub through and see Friday the 18th and Saturday the 19th, the 23rd, 24th, and holy crap, the 25th, 26th, and 27th, and 28th would be insane. So this is KP4. And the 27th is going to be KP5. So, you know, basically, if I'm going to plan a trip and I have some flexibility and I could book it in like a short like window um, very quickly, I would just book some plane tickets to Iceland for those days right there because I know that it's going to be, these are relatively accurate. Um, and basically, you would just want to figure out. Uh, what days that it's going to be strong and keep an eye on it. So once it gets dark, you'll see the, you know, the activity here in real time and you can set the app to give you notifications when there's a spike. So when the activity gets high, it'll actually send you a notification, which is really handy. But basically, you know, you can see here the hours. So let's say that it's going to be strong hypothetically. Um, let's say what day is, this is, so this is today, so this is tomorrow here. So let's say like tomorrow at uh, 11 p.m. it's supposed to be strong, it shows it's a one. But let's say that it says it's gonna be a five, for instance. First off, I would check the weather. So I would go to the website that I showed you and I would go over here to Friday, I'm sorry, Thursday and then find 11 p.m. So it would be in Iceland, 11 p.m. would be like, I guess, two hours behind this. So it would be, this is kind of on the fly, off the cuff here. So I might not be right, but this, something still streams strange to me that this is showing sunlight when I'm selecting a night, a night time. But for the example, so we would, go to the weather site and check. So I'm just gonna go back to this cloud forecast here because this site is not working for us. So let's go over here and just check. So this would be accurate to 11 p.m. Iceland here. So 2100, I'm sorry, we need 2300. So then at 11 p.m. I can see where the windows of cloud free areas are. And I'm gonna to plan to be in one of those areas. And if I can, I'm gonna pre-scout the area and figure out what my foreground's gonna be in the daytime and, and make a plan for what I'm gonna shoot at night or potentially get my blue hour shots, like I mentioned, to composite the Aurora into afterwards. So that's kind of the, the, the planning. And then you, know, you can use the, low, the light pollution map as well obviously um, not a huge factor in Iceland. You just know that you can't shoot it in kind of these really big cities. So there's only a couple in Iceland. So once you have the planning down, then we, you know, we need to get the settings. So I actually, let me do this. Let me stop sharing for a second. And I'm gonna add a file to the chat so we got an aurora checklist here yeah. so you guys should be able to download and open this uh checklist so if i pull let me share my screen again yeah so this is just something that i made just kind of as a checklist for people to photograph the aurora okay. can you guys see my screen yeah i can see it is it something so, um that you could um, provide me with a link and I'll download it if and if people ask yeah, me for yeah, yeah. would that be okay to do that yeah for sure it's actually stored in like a google drive folder okay. so it's, you can okay. share it and people can okay. save it or it, or is it on your website somewhere and it's we'll not do, okay <laughs> but it should oh be. my god I was trying to help you out get my yeah. website <laughs> so it's just a checklist what to bring 
what you know what to do while shooting in your camera settings so something that i just discussed a minute ago was that my focus was out of um you know i was out of focus for some of these shots so it's really easy to get excited when you're shooting the aurora and just completely miss your focus and you know shoot an incredible set of aurora shots out of focus or not tack sharp so that's something that you want to do immediately is just confirm your focus. So you can either focus on a star in live view and just zoom in really far and then, you know, manually focus with the autofocus turned off till the star gets pin, pin sharp. Or you can memorize on that little focal window where the infinity point for the sky is because sometimes it's in the middle of that little infinity symbol and sometimes it's like to the right or the left. So you can memorize exactly where it is and just put, put it there really quickly with like your flashlight and you can see it. Or you can, you know, basically, um, well, you can find that point if you focus somewhere off in the distance, like really far with your wide angle lens in the daytime, then it'll show you, it'll confirm that as well uh, for you to see. But I know some people tape their lens, their focus ring so that it doesn't change from infinity while they're shooting. I don't do that because sometimes I'm changing my focus point for like the foreground if I'm doing uh, shots that I'm gonna do blending and stacking and stuff like that for noise reduction. But that's an option as well. So the focus is, is critical. You can't fix that in post, right? So you can fix a lot of stuff in post, but if your shot's out of focus, like forget it. So that's something that I actually, I have a friend that shot a whole set of Aurora images. It was his first time ever seeing the Aurora. And he had the whole set of shots out of focus. I won't tell you his name, but he was like, so he was just like sick afterwards. So that's something that you guys um, should consider. Um, and then as far as the settings go, so, White balance isn't too important if you are shooting in raw. For instance, you can change this. So like, for instance, I, I really like cooler night shots. So I like to cool my shots off. So this is straight out of camera. And then this is with some raw adjustments. Basically, I just changed over the, you know, the, the white balance. So I just made it cooler. So white balance isn't super critical, but you can always set a manual white balance with your Kelvin and your camera. So for me, I like cooler shots. So I usually put my white balance cooler to like 3,300 or like 4,000 kind of in that range. So below 5,600, which is daylight or 5,500. Um, so that's something to consider, but you can fix, fix it in, in post if you're shooting in raw very easily. So always shoot raw, of course. And the shutter speed is, uh, going to be a factor when you come into play with the 500 rule. So the 500 rule states that basically if you have uh, a, a focal length, I'm going to pull up my calculator real quick. So the 500 rule states that basically whatever your focal length is divided by 500 will give you your shutter, max shutter speed without getting star streaks. So let's say I have a 14 millimeter lens. Let's go, I'm sorry, actually, I said that backwards. So 500 divided by 14 will give you your number. So this is, this is not a very accurate number. I, I like to just plug in 400, which is a little more conservative. And that'll give you a more kind of safe number to where you're not gonna get star streaks. So at 400, at 14 millimeters, it says I can get 28 second 20.57 seconds so in my experience that's still too a little bit uh too long i think another factor is the resolution of your camera so higher resolution sensors will pick up more star trails mm -hmm. and i don't know the science behind that but it's a fact so if you have like a higher res camera then you maybe even want to divide it by like 300 to be safe so what I do is I check my focus by taking a shot and reviewing it quickly, zooming in and just confirming that it's sharp and that I'm not getting star streaks before I continue to keep taking shots, um, you know, consecutively and, you know, potentially messing them up. So I would zoom in, like I said, and check the stars. 
just kind of scrub through the image. And this is taking a second to actually load here. But so somebody's, somebody's asking, and maybe I'm jumping the gun. Do you yeah. stack multiple images for your Aurora shots? So that's the thing. You can do that with Milky Way, not so much with the Aurora, because the Aurora is moving. So the Milky Way, you can stack. You can stack your foreground shots, but not your sky, because the sky is going to be different from shot to shot. So okay. it's going to be very hard for you to line those up and stack them. But you can definitely do that for your foreground. So if you want to take multiple shots for your foreground at night and then take a separate shot for the sky, focus at the sky, shorter shutter speed, you know, then you can blend those together and you still get a very realistic, true to the scene photo um, with the noise reduced foreground. So yeah, it would be hard. And even if you did like a track shot with the Aurora because it's moving, like the the longer the shutter speed so this is something you have to take and consider outside of the star trails the shutter speed so if the aurora is moving super quickly then to freeze the details and the textures like you can see the the textures here like these lines to freeze those you need a shorter shutter speed because if you did a long shutter speed then this just becomes blurry right like mm -hmm. the camera's recording the light and the light's moving and changing. So it's basically just, you know, overlapping itself and it's writing all that light onto the sensor, onto the file, and you wind up with like a green blob. So to freeze the texture, you have to have a shorter shutter speed. So this is something to consider for either the starch streaks or the Aurora um, speed is your shutter. So when you have a short shutter, for instance, then you need to compensate with the aperture of the ISO. So I really like shooting Astro, uh, Northern Lights and Milky Way with like a 1.8 lens because you can let so much light in that you can still get quicker shutter speeds without ramping your ISO, you know, past 1600, 2000 even. So that's something to consider. But if you're in a tight situation and the Aurora is just like going crazy and you want to freeze it, you need a fast shutter speed and a really high ISO, basically, or your image is going to be black. Um, you know, if you're limited to 2.8. So, something to consider for sure. Uh, it's really just like a like a dance between the settings and just figuring out what's giving you the best result and just adapting it on the fly, based off of the situation. So before I lose this question, um, somebody, Marsha's asking, do you have to worry about temperature? Is there a temperature that you might not go out? Mm. So in Iceland, I, yeah, no. You don't have to worry about temperature if you take the right precautions. And at least it's been my experience. I've been in really cold temperatures, um, never below freezing. So I have seen people's stories from like Canada where they go out and shooting Astro and stuff below freezing and they're crazy and it's just sounds risky but i've i've been near zero temperatures and really it's just a matter of keeping your skin covered and wearing a lot of layers you know doubling up your socks um you know just layering okay, forget, and, forget the body what about your camera that's more important <laughs> the camera body oh, okay well, no, no, so, she, probably, she was probably asking for, ten, for body, yeah. but I'm more interested about the camera. So I, yeah, so cameras, professional cameras are weather sealed and meant to with, withhold, withstand temperatures like that. Yeah. You know, crop sensors, you know, maybe not, I don't know. Um, one thing to consider is batteries. So batteries die faster when it's cold. Yep. So there's a trick that you can do. You can actually take your batteries and put them inside your coat. So like if I'm going out shooting, I'll put, you know, two batteries here inside my coat underneath three layers and it's going to keep them warm and it'll keep them okay. from dying basically because the coal will actually kill your batteries. Okay. So also something to consider is just, you know, bring a bunch of extra batteries out in scenarios like that. So Adrienne's got a good question here. She wants to know, how do you avoid grain? Yeah, so it's tough. I mean, some, some cameras are going to show more grain than others really it's just it's just what it is um the a7s2 for instance sony's 
Sony's mirrorless is like, or I guess they have a three now, which just came out after like five years, um, is really known for its super nice night performance. So you could shoot it like ISO 20,000 and you won't even see grain. I don't understand how, but you know, it's just, it's just one of the benefits of the camera and the smaller sensor. But for instance, this was taken on the, I think this was on my D850 and the the noise performance is pretty good on this camera but you can see there's really just no way of avoiding noise uh, with night photography at high ISOs so you can see the noise is pretty strong in this image and the ISO is only 4000 do, so, do, do you run software through it like there's topaz to noise now do you ever use that yeah so i do my D, my noise reduction in a filter called Define from Nick Collection. Okay. So there's a free version of that that you can still get. And it's, uh, I, I can actually just share the files with you because if you download the files from Nick Collection's website, they still give you access to that free version. They've somehow built in some pop-up that asks you to update like to the paid version. So it's really annoying. But I have the files for the free version you can actually just Google it as well and, and download them from any site that's not DxO's website. And you can get the, the free version of Nick Collection when Google made it um, without that annoying, you know, install the latest edition pop-up. So I can actually just show you guys briefly uh, an edit on the Aurora as well. That would be helpful, just kind of like the basic workflow and then maybe some noise reduction. That'd be great. I don't know how much time we have. Um, I'm going to make you wrap up in about 10 minutes. Can you do it in 10? Yep. Yep. I actually didn't realize that we were already an hour in. <laughs> because you love this stuff. Yes. I could talk about the Aurora all day. So let's pull up, pull up one of those crazy shots. So this is one of our, um, actually, I, oh, I know why I have this. Set the JPEG plus RAW is because I, I do Wi-Fi. I have a Wi-Fi app on my phone so I can transfer yep. uh, photos yep. to my phone. So for like quick story updates, so I can show people the insane Aurora. Yep. So I set it to that so I could do the quick That's update. That's oh. neat watching it. So you guys, yeah. if you uh, haven't caught on, he is on Instagram uh, more than I am, I think. So, um, and one of the things that he really utilizes the My Story feature um, wonderfully. So if you want to do some Thank you. armchair uh, traveling with him while he's freezing his tail off in Iceland, you can <laughs> kind of watch, just watch a story. And it's fun to kind of see all these places that, you know, we can dream about going to and, and uh, use them for a scouting. Yeah. <laughs> do your scouting. So you. <laughs> dream about it, but then do it. Just yeah. go. So yeah. this is my thing. It's like, I... I'm really big in mindset and this is, applies to everything like your career, your, you know, yeah. success, your happiness, everything. It's all mindset. Right. So like my thing is, is that, and this is something that I prioritize is the travel, right? Like travel for me is the priority and I make it happen. I spend my extra money on it. You know, I don't, I don't think about how to do it or I'm, I'm sorry. I don't think about like, if I'm going to do it, I just I figure out how, right. So if you guys want to see the Aurora, you want to go to Iceland, I mean, obviously there's problems, there's some restrictions right now and stuff, uh, but you can, you know, maybe find an alternative. Make it happen, you know, like seriously, life's short. You don't know when your last day is. So um, enough on that, that tangent there. I'm going to show you guys really real quick. If you just open up a camera, a photo from Cam uh, Adobe Bridge, it comes in the camera raw, which is basically kind of like Lightroom within Photoshop. So it's like Photoshop's Lightroom. So very similar whole setup here, guys. So if you, you know, want to follow along uh, with something similar in Lightroom, it's basically identical. So the first thing that I would do with my- now, me, Is this a completely unedited image? This is unedited. Okay. This is straight out of camera. I hate you, John yeah. Weatherby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, this is this is rare that you get like, you know, incredible 
straight out of camera. But for me, this doesn't isn't perfect because the foreground is crap, right? Like, yeah, you know, this whole composition and everything is crap. It's just I I shot in this direction because the sky was going crazy, and this aurora actually started getting good as we were on our way out to our composition. So that's the thing is if you get if you can get to the place before it's going crazy, you're in good shape. But we had to stop before our composition before we got to our destination so we could point the camera up and start taking pictures. So the first thing I usually always do is I remove chromatic aberration and I put on my profile corrections. And then you can see it corrects for the distortion in the vignette. So sometimes I leave the distortion correction off on wide angle shots because I like the, the distortion from wide angles. And it kind of stretches out the scene a little bit and makes it look funny. But in this case, I'm gonna leave it on because I think it straightens the horizon out for us. So that's the first thing. And then I would adjust the white balance. So like I mentioned, I really like cooler Aurora. So I usually push the white balance to be a little bit cooler like this. And then you can play around with uh, you know, the tint and see what kind of effects you get. If you go here more magenta, it's gonna give it more of kind of a purple tone kind of more of a cooler purple tone if you go with green it's going to make it warmer and really make the you know the green and the aurora more pronounced so this is you know all subjective here but i really like kind of like a nice cooler looking image here you can also play around with the shadows and the the tint and the shadows and the calibration so you know you can make this more green or more purple the shadows and that'll kind of complement the highlights which in this case is the aurora so play around with stuff like that there i don't usually do vignetting or i mean if we're going to just do like a single edit image i would probably add some vignette this would kind of help draw a viewer's eye kind of towards the middle of the scene so the way i usually do vignettes is i make it strong and i turn the feather off so i can see where it is and then I use the midpoint to put it where I want, turn the feather where I want it, and then just decrease the strength. So I just want to kind of something like that. So I, I take the I make the vignette corrections so I get the the vignette caused by the lens away, and then I add it back, which is kind of counterproductive. But when you add it back, you have more control over how it's applied versus the effect from the lens. So I don't usually do noise reduction and sharpening or anything like that when I'm just doing raw development, but I'll show you guys kind of briefly. I would I would bring down the highlights usually a touch. I mean, in this case, we don't really have highlights blown out, especially in the Aurora, so I don't really need to. One thing that makes images really pop is the whites. So if I bring the whites up, watch what happens. See how it goes crazy? Mm -hmm. So you really want to find a, a spot, kind of like a happy mid, middle ground. So one, one trick is, is you see how there's parts blowing out in the Aurora here. One workaround for this is if you have like a hot spot like that, you can make a radial filter and then set this to be inverted so that the effect goes on the outside and then make the filter basically around that hot spot and then make your adjustment here. And then that way, that area that was getting blown out is in the middle of the filter and the effects on the outside of it. And then you don't wind up with that, that hot spot. So I make the image pop with the whites and just make sure I'm not clipping highlights. And I think I am in some spots, but it's not So Chris bad. is asking, do you do any dodging and burning to accentuate the Aurora? I don't really do dodging and burning. You know, I, I add all, a lot of different contrast adjustments and effects in Photoshop that make darks darker and brights brighter. But I don't really do a ton of manual dodging and burning. I don't like shape the light. I kind of just accentuate it. Okay. I kind of like make it how um, I just, I yeah, I don't really do a ton of actual dodging and burning. So black points so i'm probably clipping on the blacks here you can see if you if you clip if you enable or toggle these guys up here you can check to see your if you're clipping so like if i go down here you can see in blue where the blacks clip but 
if it's just kind of kissing the edge there, I'm fine. Uh, then vibrance, maybe I add just a little bit. And like I said, I don't really do sharpening or noise reduction here, but if I was going to do noise reduction here, then I would use this noise reduction here. So, and you can also do it by making a graduated filter like this and then applying noise reduction. So it's only applied to the sky and then you can paint it out of your foreground, for instance. So like if I show my mask here, I can see where my graduated filter is. And if I do my noise reduction like this, then I can go up to my erase tool here and I can just paint that effect, you know, out of the foreground or wherever I want it so that it's only being applied to the sky. So that's one way to do this. Like I said, I don't do noise reduction um, here. I do it with define. So I'll show you real quick. So once I'm happy with my raw development, if I hit P on the keyboard, you can see it before and after. And I actually really kind of, I actually kind of like it warm. It looks kind of nice, but let me warm it up just a little bit. Yeah, something like that. All right, so then I open in Photoshop. And then the beauty of Photoshop is layers. So you can make a duplicate of your layer by hitting Command-J on a Mac or Control-J on a PC. And then once you have a new layer, you can apply your noise reduction to that layer and then use a layer mask to manually paint it just where you want it. So let's go up to this filter that I mentioned to you, Define, it's Nick Collection. And you can do the same thing with Camera Raw like I just showed you by making a duplicate layer, applying the noise reduction to the whole layer with Camera Raw and then painting it in like I'm about to show you. So it zooms in to your image here and it'll, it's basically applying some automatic noise reduction here. So if I click off the preview tab, you can see before and after. So it's pretty good, it's really strong, and it's definitely taking out details in the foreground. If I go down to the foreground, 100%, it's uh, you know affecting the foreground. And this is why we wanna paint it in manually. So let's see if this will load quickly, because I know we're time sensitive at this point. Yeah, so you can see, it doesn't do a terrible job, but you can see down here, it takes the noise out, but you lose some details. So this is what I would do. I would have my noise reduction good to go and apply it and it applies it to the whole layer. And it's really trying hard right now. All right, so then I would make a layer mask on that layer and invert it by hitting Command I or Control I. And now the layer's hidden with this inverted mask. And wherever I paint with white on this black inverted mask, it's gonna paint that effect in or paint the layer in and make it visible. So I can just make my opacity and flow 100% and start painting that noise reduction just in the sky. And if you hit the backslash key, then it brings up this, uh, this red quick mask, or you know, basically mask uh, visualization here for you to see where you're painting. And then I can just basically paint my effect just where I want it. And this is the beauty of Photoshop, again, with layers, guys, you have like full control. And then hit the backslash key again, you can zoom in and you could you know, toggle between black and white and paint it back in or paint it back out in certain areas. So because the, the no, there's noise in the foreground, but it's not, um, but I lose detail if I apply the effect at 100%, I could change my opacity to maybe 30% and the flow maybe to like 30 or 40%. So that it's going to be way, way less uh, st strong brush now. So now if I just do a couple streaks over the foreground, I'm painting that noise reduction from that inverted layer mask in very subtly. And it's not at 100%. So it's not going to be as strong as the sky where I want to apply the most noise reduction to, but it's going to be subtle enough to take some of the noise out. So it maybe shows this, um, noise reduction at maybe 20% or so. So it takes some of the noise, but not losing the detail. 
So once I'm happy with that, I would merge the layers. So can command option shift E or control alt shift E. And then you have this, you know, single layer with the noise reduced sky and this somewhat sharp detail foreground. And then I would add some cool effects. So you can do like a photo filter. Photo filters are one of my favorites, uh, adjustment layers, and you can do the cool cooling filter for instance so that looks nice or warming look kind of cool as well um, but by default it's warming you can play around with these different ones so maybe if we added like magenta or emerald emerald would make it more green maybe i think there's an actual green so green would make it more green photo filters are really good for helping to blend blue hour foregrounds to help kind of sell that composite. You can kind of tone them to match the aurora. So the foreground with the aurora that you're blending in, for example, would have a green tint to it. So you could add that with something like that photo filter, or you could, you know, add a color balance and go to the highlights and then maybe ramp up the greens. Um, but color balance is something else I also really love. You can really have some specific control over the tones and the highlights and the midtones, and then the shadows separately. So that's really nice. So maybe, you know, if I just added some magenta to the midtones, you see how I made the purples and the aurora really pop. Mm -hmm. If I turn that adjustment off and on, you can see it really just added some separation between the green and the red and really kind of accentuated that, the purple part of the flare. So I really like that. And, like I said, I like to add contrast with either curves or levels. So I would darken the darks and I would brighten the brights. And this is kind of like an S curve. This is a subtle S curve. Turn that off and on, you can see that contrast. And then the beauty again of layers is you can turn the opacity down so you can make it as strong as you want or more subtle. So this is nice and yeah, I, like for this, I would totally just take the sky image and drop it into a different foreground probably if this is an actual edit. At yeah. this point, I could apply some sharpening, but sharpening is going to introduce more noise. So that's something you got to consider. Uh, so that's tough. But I would save this at this point probably if I was just going to post it on social media or something. Like, I don't I care. I love it. it. <laughs> I think it's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, so you are, are you, I don't want to wrap you up, but are you close? Yeah, that's pretty much it. That was the gist of the whole process. Um, you know, basically, got to be somewhere that you can see them on the right latitude. You have to be away from cities, ideally, so no light pollution. Ideally, it's a new moon so that you have a very dark sky and the aurora is going to look bright and you have a clear sky. So you got to find patches of you know no clouds okay. and then you just gotta know your settings and it's second nature from there how about um and sharing your screen and then i'm gonna hit you with one or two um selfish questions all right no problem <laughs> okay iceland yeah and um, you uh, you know i i think you've gone to like you said 12 times but i i I'm thinking like nine of those is since I've met you in the last three years. Um, yes, okay. that's accurate. All of them in three years. <laughs> if if um, your top three photo locations in Iceland, what are your favorites? Oh, okay. Um, hmm. Kirkjafell comes to mind first. Kirkjafell is this iconic mountain and has a nice waterfall in the front, very iconic Iceland shot. That's the shot that sold me on Iceland that I first saw and I was like, I need that photo. And that was like the one that made me want to book a trip. So Kirkjafell, Kirkjafell's Foss is the waterfall. That's my favorite for sure. Uh, the highlands are amazing, but mostly by drone. So it's really, it's a little challenging to photograph the highlands without a drone. But if you have a drone, it's like drone heaven. Okay. So lots of craters, like volcanic, you know, crater lakes and stuff like that. So, and like glacial river streams that make these really nice abstract, beautiful patterns. So that's really awesome. Um, there's also the uh, 
the colorful mountains. So Lan, Lan Manilagar is, I probably butchered that, but it's these like rainbow kind of colored mountains. So check those out. Let's see what else. Vesterhorn Mountain is that spot that I showed you with the moonlit foreground, very iconic mountains. So that's highly recommended. The Glacier Lagoon and Diamond Beach highlights. Yeah, Diamond sure. Beach, yeah. All the waterfalls. I mean, you could just Google Iceland waterfall and find 10 must visit waterfalls. And let's see more, something more hidden, more or less known. Uh, I really love this rock in Northern Iceland called uh, Kritsker. Kritsker, so I, I know I butchered that as well. I cannot speak Icelandic to save my life, but, and it's spelled like nothing like Kritsker, but it says rock in Northern Iceland and I could share my screen maybe for a second. Sure. Okay. So this rock in, oh, I gotta click it again. This will be my last screen share guys. Let's go. What is it here? Okay, so this is Kritsiker, and it's not even spelled like that, so I don't know how it's pronounced like that, but it's this rock that looks like a, a drinking rhinoceros or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, the legend is it's actually a troll, but I think it looks like a rhino. And I actually saw the most incredible sight I've ever seen in my life there. So this is also why it's very special to me, but I saw this there. And it's this rare, uh, rare clouds called Nacreous clouds or Polar stratospheric clouds. Yeah. And I saw them uh, right over this rock, perfectly centered with the super moon, a full moon rising behind it that lit them up. So this was like a super special experience also. So yeah, those are like my favorite spots, I would say. If I had to give you a short list. I'm such a little fangirl. I'm like, I know that picture, I know that picture, I know that picture. So. Chris, yes, that's Havitsaker. Yeah. yeah, like I said, it doesn't look like it's spelled. <laughs> All right, John, I'm going to shut you down, and I'm going to thank you for coming on and sharing what you know. And Yeah, uh, it's called uh, Nacreous Clouds, Adrian. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's good. Um, so, guys, John, is it um, his website? Are you still at johnweatherby.com? Uh, John... JohnWeatherby.com is yeah. my site I'm converting over to yeah. my commercial site with Art. Right. Yeah. WeatherbyPhotography.com so, and also the new courses are, uh, that I just released are ProPhotographyCourses.com. Yeah. So yesterday, that. John released his first, is it, I'm going to say it's the first Landscape Pro class. And you, if you guys are interested in that, check it out at ProPhotographyCourses.com. Did I say that right? Yeah, I'll actually just drop a link in here real quick. Okay, would you? That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, Angie was asking, do you teach workshops? And the answer is yes. So I think where, where should she go to find that? So I have, yeah, I need, a, I need, it's, it's a lot of it's kind of been in limbo right now. Um, we have a workshop in Iceland in November, for instance, that at this time is still on, but right. the restrictions are not uh cohesive for us to do it so we ha i have to basically uh, we have a, a back we have backup dates set up okay um i just dropped the link in the chat to the so just the, monitor that uh, angie yeah so uh, weatherbyphotography.com is where i have the workshops and right now i have one for new york which i had to push back a whole nother month again because of this quarantine rule the 14 day mandatory and then the Iceland one, like I said, we have backup dates for March next year in case we have to reschedule again, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so online workshops are my focus going forward because I learned quickly during yeah. this whole period that yeah. in-person activities are never going to be the same. <laughs> no. Not uh, for a while. Uh, so, okay. Uh, guys, let me, John, thanks, thanks again for, you know, I know you're exhausted because I know that you've been working on launching your um, online workshop. So 
I, no worries. I, I feel for you. I know that you're tired, but I, I do it's appreciate you came on and did this for us. So guys, next week, um, we're going, we were talking a couple of weeks ago when John Fisher was here about maybe doing an edit along. So that's what we're going to plan for next Wednesday. So uh, monitor his Instagram and monitor mine. Uh, John Fisher, can you put your your Instagram in there for me right now? And uh, we're going to figure out how to get some raw files to you guys. And then you guys can just kind of, uh, uh, he's going to launch Photoshop and, and you guys can kind of walk through what he's doing um, if you're interested in doing that. But that's what we're going to do next week. So that being said, thank you guys for all. Oh, thanks. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And until next Wednesday, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we will see you again next week. Mm -hmm.